Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the uh, DC office of the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States. My name is uh, Bob Rich, and I'm executive director, and I'm very pleased to welcome everyone here to the room and online. Arcus has been uh, working for more than 25 years to connect Arctic research across boundaries through communication, coordination, and collaboration. And for the last uh, four months now, we've been doing this Arctic Research Seminar Series in Washington, D.C. We're a nonprofit consortium of organizations and individuals that are interested in advancing inquiry, uh, discovery, and understanding in this important region of the Arctic and informing sound decision making. This seminar series is designed to provide unique access to some of the leading research that's going on in the Arctic and to provide this information to federal officials, members of the DC policy community, and the broader public interested in the changing Arctic. The ideas shared here represent the cutting edge of what we're exploring and learning up north, and also what it means for the US and the rest of the world. For those of you in the room here, I'd encourage you to take a look at the materials that you were handed when you arrived. You should have received an evaluation form, which is very important. We'd like you to return that to us at the conclusion uh, to the registration desk so that we can improve these seminars and continue to provide the best possible information and speakers for you. We'll also take a look at the information about ARCUS and the uh, services that we offer to the research community and membership. We would love to invite you to become a member. Um, all organizations of all different types are able to become members, uh, agencies, uh, academic institutions, corporations, um, nonprofits, and individuals can also become members of ARCUS as well. So hopefully you will take advantage of that opportunity. I'm happy to sign you up here or you can sign up on our website at www.arcus.org. We're currently joined by uh, 123 registrants online from throughout the United States and other countries. And just a short uh, lit look through the list, uh, I saw that we have people joining us from Canada, Denmark, Germany, Greenland, Hong Kong, Iceland, Russia, Sweden, and in addition to the uh, oh, 20 or so people here in DC. So for those of you on the webinar, my colleagues are available to answer any questions you have about Arcus or about the seminar. Um, so you and they, they will uh, forward them to me here in DC so we'll be able to ask them at the conclusion of the presentation. You'll have the opportunity to submit the text questions and the way you do that is by typing your questions into the question pane on the right hand side of your screen um, and then those questions will, will come to the moderators and we'll be able to ask them at the conclusion. You can send your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll collect them at that point. Whether you're here or online, we invite each of you to become an ARCUS member. So welcome to do that. And I'd also like to acknowledge our partners in the uh, seminar series. The Consortium for Ocean Leadership, which is uh, the organization that enables us to use this wonderful meeting space. Thank you also to the uh, Polar Research Board of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine for their assistance with planning and registration. And of course, I want to thank the National Science Foundation Division of Polar Programs for major financial support to ARCUS and everything we do, including this seminar series. So now, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Ted Schur is a professor recently relocated to the Center for Ecosystem Science and Society at the Department of Biological Sciences at Northern Arizona University. He's done more than a decade and a half of field research in boreal and Arctic ecosystems and has more than 100 peer-reviewed publications in high-profile journals such as Science, Nature, and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, as well as numerous book chapters, reports, and published abstracts in the Proceedings of Scientific Meetings. He leads, uh, has led dozens of grant proposals worth millions of dollars in support of this research and has won many awards, which I'm not going to go into all of them, but I would just uh, point out the uh, new investigator awards from NASA, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the National Science Foundation, and he's a, a Leopold Leadership Fellow um, and is now an advisory board member of that program. Ted uh, is a native of Michigan and graduated magna cum laude uh, from the University of Michigan. He received a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and a, a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellowship at the University of California, Irvine, before arriving at the University of Florida in 2002, where he reached full professor and remained into 2014. 
Ted's presentation today will be on the topic of regional and global implications of changing permafrost. Please join me in welcoming to the Arcus DC seminar series, Dr. Ted Scher. Great, thanks Bob. That was a kind introduction and it's good to see so many faces here on this rainy day. Um, I was wondering if I was going to be speaking mostly to online participants, but um, it's nice to have uh, faces in the room as well. Um, I'm wondering if I can turn on the front lights a little bit here. Um, I think I have some pictures that will show up a little bit better if I do. Um, Bob mentioned my uh, involvement with the Leopold program and really that's a program focused on mid-career scientists and it's sort of a shift in thinking from what got me tenure at a university which was the production of science but it, it really was a focus on thinking about who's consuming that science and so one reason that I'm here speaking today is, is trying to think about the science that we are um, documenting, the changes that are going on in the Arctic, but then to think about the people that need to know this information and what the forms are that they can use it in. And so I'm hoping that my presentation today will sort of talk a little bit about the science. We'll talk about how we're, we're creating the science knowledge and then I'm hoping at the end we're going to have a dialogue, a discussion, and questions from the audience really that are going to help me understand how the information we're producing is, is then being used. So I know there's a wide variety of backgrounds in the room, so um, I sort of took a stab at um, the kind of slides that I thought were important. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of, of permafrost in the Arctic, how it's changing, and then I'm going to um, look at, for a brief period, sort of the, the local to regional impacts of changing permafrost, and then get into sort of the global consequences, the feedback through the climate system where most of my research is focused. And then I'm also going to sort of, along the way of telling you the science story, tell you sort of how scientists are operating to, to create this information. Um, I'm representing um, both as a faculty member of Northern Arizona University, but I'm also the action team lead for um, permafrost for the study of environmental Arctic change program. And so I wanted to use that as sort of a starting point, thinking about the work that I'm going to talk to you about today. The search program is funded by NSF. Um, it's a program that's been around for a decade, but every five years it goes through a renewal. And in the renewal that just got funded last year, um, there's sort of a new reframing of this. So it both funds the networking opportunities of Arcus, but it's also um, now funding what's called these action teams. And you can see there's three action teams here, the sea ice, the land ice, and the permafrost, which is the one that I led. And it's an attempt to kind of link um, science into you know, the networking that's going on within the search program. Now I have that phrase there um, which is our motivating phrase for permafrost. We are documenting and understanding how degradation of permafrost will influence both the Arctic and the global systems. And so, and then at the very end it says using synthesis science and you'll see that that's sort of a theme in, in my talk today. I'm going to be talking about synthesis science what I mean by it in sort of what its value is. And synthesis science really is bringing together the primary literature, individual studies, into these higher level science papers that can kind of distill and broadcast that information. So that's a real focus of the permafrost action team. It mentions both Arctic and global systems. So we're going to think about how changes in permafrost affect inhabitants of the Arctic. We're also going to think about how changing permafrost affects global society. So the permafrost action team is, is, is just spinning up, like I mentioned, so it's, um, it's building on a, a foundation in the past. So I have one um, icon, I think I'm going to try to use this uh, mouse here as my pointer. Are you there, mouse? Yes. So we have one icon, that's the, the icon for the permafrost carbon network. And so a lot of the science results I'm going to talk to you about today come out of the permafrost carbon network. It's a group of scientists that are bringing together information about how the degradation of permafrost carbon influences climate. And I'm going to talk to you more about that feedback loop. But the permafrost action team as a whole is going beyond just the topic of permafrost carbon. So we're also thinking about how permafrost influences um, infrastructure, ecosystem services, and essentially human well-being in the Arctic. And those are broad topics. And you can see on the slide that they're sort of dashed um, empty spots. So that's where we're sort of pushing in the future. 
And that's a big landscape. We know a lot of people are involved in those topics, including people in this room. And so we're hoping as the Permacross Action Team um, to sort of partner with ongoing activities and sort of help facilitate that in the future. So that's just a little infomercial about um, what we're trying to do as the action team. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of a background. I sense that a lot of people here work in the Arctic. They're, they're probably familiar looking at um, the Earth with the North Pole right in the center. <laughs> There's many audiences that I show this to and they don't know what planet I'm showing them. Um, if you look at the North Pole, um, I think it's sort of intriguing. I wish I had my mouse. Where are you? Yes, Beth Nyland, thank you. I always think this is a funny picture because I think, oh, Alaska's upside down here. <laughs> but um, of course, we can pick out Alaska, and, and we see what's de what's depicted on this map really is a distribution of permafrost. And so permafrost is perennially frozen ground, and it's distributed around the circumpolar north, and primarily Russia, underlain by permafrost, Canada, Alaska, most of the Arctic nations have some permafrost. The deep uh, purple colors show you that permafrost is everywhere. As you kind of go away from the North Pole and you go south, you get these lighter shades of pur purple where permafrost is in some places but not others. Overall, it's, it's underlying about 25% of the Northern Hemisphere land surface. So it's a big area underlain by permafrost, but it just happens to be in places where not many people are living. Okay, so that's the backdrop of permafrost. and I. I think a picture like this is very instructive. I was just talking before the, the talk about looking underground, and so that's that's something we cannot do with our satellites very well, and we can't do it as people see what's happening under our feet. We're actually looking underground here because this hill slope has eroded, and it's really instructive. We're looking into the permafrost. Now, if I could have you guys walk out of the seminar learning one thing, it would be the title of the slide. <laughs> permafrost thaws, it doesn't melt. You know, you have to think about it this way. So if you go home and you want to make dinner, you pull a hamburger out of the freezer and you put it on the counter, and you're waiting for that hamburger to thaw before you cook it. You're not waiting for it to melt. And the same is true with permafrost ground. Most of it is solid material. There's rock, there's sediment, there's soil. There is ice in the ground, but overall, permafrost scientists prefer this term. So that's the sort of take-home message um, for you to learn today. There's a, some other features that you can see in this picture. At the very surface, there's something called the active layer because it's warm in the Arctic in the summer. So the, the surface of the soil actually thaws in the summer and then refreezes in the winter. So technically, that's not permafrost. It's part of the active layer because it's not perennially frozen. That layer is about uh, 20 to 50 centimeters thick. And then, like I said, it's frozen in the winter. Below that, you can see both um, frozen soil and um, I always have to find my mouse. There it is. These sort of whitish things are big blocks of ice. So this is particularly ice-rich permafrost. So the ice in the ground could melt, but as the permafrost thaws. And then interspersed is this soil, this frozen soil that's filled with organic carbon. So it's the remains of plants and animals that have been stored for hundreds or thousands of years in this ecosystem. So this has been frozen since the last ice age. So these are all important characters that we're going to kind of return back to in our discussion of permafrost. Okay, so the reason we're here, of course, is the whole globe is warming, but the Arctic is warming about twice as fast. Arctic amplification. They, this is not some model projection of the future. This is right now, NOAA data. The poles are warming much faster. I'm not going to go into the physical reasons why that is, but anything that we're experiencing in temperate zones is happening twice as fast in the Arctic. This winter, if you've been hearing the news, we had uh, this, the sea ice maximum, which is in March, was the lowest extent ever. Um, Alaskan temperatures never got cold. Lots of phenomena that kind of match this pattern. So if we go from atmospheric temperatures, we can ask what's happening to the permafrost itself. And this is a map showing, it's probably a little bit hard to see the details, it's showing the distribution of carbon, this organic carbon in the soil, that's the different yellow colors. And then the way we're monitoring permafrost temperatures with these boreholes, these, these holes in the ground where we can actually measure the temperature and detect changes over time. And so these are graphs um, from the, the GTNP network, the permafrost temperature network, which document from the 70s until today increasing permafrost temperature that mirrors increasing global temperatures. So the permafrost is, is degrading and declining. These are all sort of deep in the permafrost. They're still frozen, but it's indicating that changes are happening. <laughs> 
we have this data from a number of sites around the world, but unlike something like sea ice, we can't photograph this from satellites. So we don't have quite the global picture that we do with remote sensing, but we do have it from ground-based measurements. Okay, I want to mention one other phenomenon. This is sort of backdrop of how, so permafrost can get warmer, its temperature can increase. So if the air is getting warmer, the permafrost will get warmer. But you can also have this phenomenon we call abrupt permafrost thaw. And so there is um, a person standing inside this hole. Here's my mouse. If you looked carefully, I might have to use my laser here because of the, let me do that. I think the mouse is, yeah, so there's a, this will help people in the room mostly, but there's a person standing in here. So you can see this giant space here was frozen, started to thaw, and then abruptly sort of in one season would have eroded away. So the degradation of permafrost can happen from global atmosphere warming the permafrost, but you can also have this rapid thaw in sort of these particular hot spots. And so if we think about this conceptually, we can think that if the air is getting warmer, the climate's changing, here we have our active layer. It causes an expansion of the active layer, so the, this top-down thaw. And then you have these big blocks of ice within the soil. So as the active layer expands, the ice melts, that water drains away. Actually, the ground will subside. So you have sort of a lowering of the ground surface. When the ground surface lowers, water can flow into it. And so you have to imagine this as sort of a two-dimensional slice. And then one day, you can get complete erosion. This whole feature here sort of disappears as these processes happen. So here's another important thing to remember is every time we're talking about model projections of permafrost and we're talking about changes in the Arctic, they're entirely talking about these two processes. We know this happens, we know it's important, but we don't have enough process-based understanding to, to really map that across the Arctic. And so it's a big science gap that people are pushing on now, but a lot of what I'll talk about in sort of the projections are this, and you can imagine that all of this just makes everything go faster. Okay, so that's a little backdrop. That's that's your permafrost 101. Um, why do people in the Arctic care? If you think about that permafrost ground, if you take away the ice that's in there and the ground is subsiding, that's affecting human infrastructure. So most of the people that are there, if your building is put on permafrost, you start to destabilize. And some of that um, destabilization happens even when the permafrost is still frozen. But if it goes from minus 6 degrees to minus 2 degrees, that will affect the engineering. So that causes runways to slump, it causes roads to degrade away. These are all effects that people um, are experiencing in the Arctic as permafrost temperatures change. Now when people build on permafrost, they normally are engineering to try to protect the frozen ground. So people are doing that already, but your, your engineering specs would be different if the ground's at minus 4 degrees or if it's minus 0.5 degrees. So buildings that were built 20, 30 years ago would look very different and experience some of these effects. Okay, so people living in the Arctic care, and so you can, you can imagine this is a map of just Alaska, and so here's all the, the infrastructure built on permafrost, color-coded by how much permafrost is there. And you can see there's lots of infrastructure, roads, airports, um, Department of Defense installations, stuff that costs money to put there, and it's going to cost more money to mitigate um, the effects of changing permafrost. And this is from a 2003 report, but I was just talking to April Melvin. It sounds like there's some updates to sort of infrastructure at risk um, in Alaska in particular. So that'll be exciting to see. Um, what that looks like. Okay, so I'm going to uh, hold this up and just sort of boil it down. And on the science side, you know, what is really sort of the science questions that are out there? You know, we really want to know where that ground ice is. If I think of one weak link that's out there trying to understand these risks, it's where the, the ground ice is, how much of it. It's not the same in every place, and it really affects what's going to happen to the infrastructure. And then finally, I mentioned already that abrupt thaw process. We really, again, maybe can understand it on one site, but we have a hard time understanding it for the state of Alaska or at the country level. Okay, so um, I, have, I have some disclosure with the last bit of information, which is I own a cabin in Fairbanks, Alaska. It's built on permafrost, 
and that permafrost is degrading. And so every summer I go out, up there and have to re-level my cabin because it's like, sinking in the back um, as compared to the front. So you know that's great for me. I really want to study this stuff. But why should people around the whole world care about changing permafrost? And the reason for that is that what happens in the Arctic is not just staying in the Arctic. And so sort of the bottom line message of the global implications of changing permafrost is that climate change, which we know is happening, might happen much faster than we think because of changing permafrost. Now, the reason for that, again, is not for the ice in the soil, but it has to do with that organic carbon that's stored frozen. And we get this kind of feedback cycle that's triggered by changing greenhouse gases. So we know that human greenhouse gases are causing things to warm. That's changing things in the Arctic where permafrost is thawing. So that organic matter, just like that frozen hamburger out of the freezer, it starts to actually break down by bacteria and fungi. They eat the organic matter when it's not frozen. And they're doing that as part of their normal metabolism. They're releasing carbon dioxide and methane back to the atmosphere. Now, when we hear about changes in the Arctic, a lot of times you hear you know, methane, methane, methane. It's the important gas. But actually, CO2 comes out about 1,000 times the amount that methane does. And so methane is a more potent greenhouse gas. But actually, the impact on climate is going to actually come from both of these. It matters how much methane comes out. It also matters how much carbon dioxide does as well. It's a feedback loop because if you're adding more greenhouse gases, it's just making this thing happen even faster. Humans are the trigger in this case, but then this Arctic feedback causes um, a faster increase in greenhouse gases than we might otherwise know about. So if we want to know the impact on climate, we have to boil it down to these questions. We need to know how much of the carbon that's stored frozen is going to end up in the atmosphere. How fast will that happen? Is that going to happen you know, next year, 10 years, 100 years? And then the form, the ratio of this carbon dioxide and methane release is going to be the ultimate impact on climate. So those three things are real simple to, to ask. But then, of course, it's a lot of complicated science that could see that, that answer at the, at the scale of the entire Arctic. OK, so. Um, that's sort of a backdrop of both local effects and this global effect. So of course, the climate's changing everywhere. And, and things that you hear about, like changing sea level and, and in, impacts on agriculture, all the effects globally are just made more extreme by um, this contribution back from the Arctic. So that's why it's affecting global society as well as the people that live there. So I'll step back and make a little pitch. I started out with this um, idea of creating the science knowledge, but then also getting it to end users. Um, I brought a couple copies of our five-year report from the Permafrost Carbon Network. I have a copy outside and one up here. But really, the idea is that um, most people in this room probably couldn't read the papers that I'm writing. And I don't blame you. They're very technical, filled with a lot of terms. And so our idea is that. Really, as scientists, we need to get together with our individual papers, put them together in these synthesis documents, and try to understand what's going on in all these individual locations, but how that scales up to the globe. And so really, synthesis science is a starting point for you know, translating the knowledge that scientists are pr producing to sort of the action that, that decision makers or policy people um, need to do. What do we need to do? So that's what I've been doing as a scientist, trying to bring together um, information and sort of put it out there in a way that people can understand. Now, I'm going to show a few science results. And I'm looking a little bit at the clock, where this is where it's sort of the deep dive into a couple studies. Um, the deep size is about the deep dive is about four slides with one sort of summary. So I'm going to go quickly, but I'll end with that sort of summary slide to show you the state of knowledge. I think as a scientist, you want to sort of know what, you know, know what, what it is we're doing out there. Um, I'm going to just skip over this, but it's just sort of a, of a, of a, it's a pitch for why we need to sort of use synthesis science. It's essentially taking the individual literature and saying all this information under the curve is what is the knowledge, but we have to synthesize it in order to understand what it means. So I talked to you a little bit about the permafrost carbon network where we're doing this. And there's a website that you can check out some of the specific science information that we've, um, compiled. <clears throat>
So let me just give you a couple sort of key science highlights. Again, I'm going to sort of go through it quickly and then end up with a slide. But um, we spend a lot of time putting together this as a review paper from last year where we try to summarize a bunch of results, really kind of get at the magnitude of climate change, that how much, how fast, and what form. Um, and so this is a synthesis where we said of all the carbon that's frozen, so the billions and billions of tons, what is that vulnerable fraction? What might come out into the atmosphere? And we estimated as a group between 5 and 15 percent by the year 2100 if we keep warming the planet as we are doing now. So if you take the midpoint of that, 10 percent of the permafrost pool, it's a big pool. So even though 10 percent seems kind of small, you know, 100 to 150 billion tons of additional carbon in the atmosphere. Just for context, every year humans are putting about 10 billion tons. So we're talking about a lot more, although put in there over the next 100 years. So it's coming out you know, over a significant time period, but it's also a large amount. It's a little bit washed out here, but if you think about other sources, um, deforestation in the tropics primarily, it's similar into that magnitude currently, if you sort of project out, it's less than something like fossil fuel burning. So we don't, we're not talking about overwhelming everything people are doing. People are doing, and this is just adding to it. So those are important um, facts to know about the, the permafrost carbon cycle. So this is one type of emission, or, or emission estimate. Um, we sort of attack this problem from many different ways. There's not just one way to come up with this number, and so We've used um, quantitative models. I would say that estimate I was just showing you is sort of a semi-quantitative synthesis. We've taken maps of, of carbon here. We've taken distribution of carbon with depth. We've multiplied that by the decomposability of that organic carbon, and we've used global climate models to simulate climate of the future to give us new estimates of it. So this is sort of a data model um, handshake, trying to come up with these same estimates. So this is sort of a separate study sort of saying, hey, if we warm the planet as we're doing now, that's what we call RCP 8.5. That's estimating, again, up to 100 billion tons being released. RCP 4.5, that's saying we're doing something to slow human emissions, and we can see it's a lower number than being emitted from the Arctic. So slower global warming kind of reduces future Arctic emissions. Methane, so again, I mentioned that. That's and an additionality on top of this. You have to know how much methane is coming out. And then finally, we're going from that, that's sort of a handoff between data and models. This is a full model intercomparison study. So modelers build models. They're not totally sure of the results, so then they compare their models to other models. It's called a model intercomparison. We're doing that both for the retrospective, what's happened to permafrost in the past, and we're also going to think about what's happened in the future. And so there's a bunch of papers coming out of the permafrost carbon network from this modeling intercomparison activity. And there's interesting results there. A model stimulates both emissions of carbon from soil, but it's also thinking about plant uptake. So plants are growing faster. They're taking carbon out of the air, and actually that offsets some of the carbon emissions. So an additional factor is needing to know what the offset is from, from biological activity. So that was sort of a deep dive into graphs that I wasn't expecting to follow, but they're really all summarized on this single graph. So um, I showed you the results of this data model synthesis, the model projections, and a data constrained model. I also put an expert assessment and just some bottom line points here. So we, we use these future scenarios driven by the IPCC and these climate models, and then we project how much estimate how much extra carbon is going to come out of the Arctic. Again, you can see there's sort of a midpoint line here, but the midpoints range anywhere from you know, 75 to 150 billion tons of additional carbon coming out of Arctic. These numbers actually don't even show the effect of methane. So some proportion of this is methane, but we're not even accounting for this additional global warming potential. So for the actual climate impact would be a little bit higher. It's shown both at the business as usual, the red, and then the slower global warming. And so our bottom line is that you know there's a fraction of the permafrost carbon pool that's vulnerable, but it's large, and so it's going to have a big impact. We, we still have a range around it. We don't know a precise number. This is talking about the future, but we, we do think that we're, we're sort of honing in on how much might be vulnerable. It's not like to be likely to be twice as much as this, at least based on our current analysis.
Okay, so let me just take that information, give you some key outcomes. Um, the permafrost carbon pool that's frozen now is large, about twice as much carbon stored frozen than in the atmosphere. It's sensitive to climate change, and we would say that it's probably decadal to century time scale. So that's the time frame we're talking about. It's not going to stop at the year 2100. The Earth is likely to continue to keep warming. There's likely to be additional emissions, but oftentimes for, for policy purposes, we talk about the end of the century. Emissions are never going to overshadow fossil fuel. That's always going to be the trigger, probably. But it's going to accelerate how fast climate change is happening. The way we're going to see that from the atmosphere is that um, we're going to see, instead of seeing the source from the Arctic, we'll see it as a weakening biospheric sink. This is a little bit technical, but right now, a lot of the anthropogenic greenhouse gas, the coal oil gas that goes into the atmosphere, some of it's being sucked up by the terrestrial biosphere, plants and trees growing places. And right now that's sort of keeping pace. The more carbon we add to the atmosphere, the more ends up in forests. But what we'll observe is that that's going to slow down. And so if that slows down, if the biosphere takes up less, there's more in the atmosphere, that makes climate change happen faster. So even though um, this process will still be happening. What's coming out of the Arctic is just an additional carbon source. It's not currently modeled, so it's sort of added on top of what we think might be happening. And so anything we're doing to mitigate carbon to reduce emissions elsewhere, we have to keep in mind that there's these additional um, emissions coming out of places like permafrost. So far, we don't have evidence for this idea of catastrophic carbon release. And, and, you know, it's a tough word to put up there. I think for time scale of catastrophic, I say carbon, a huge carbon emission that would come out in one year or in five years or ten years would be very catastrophic for humans. <laughs> we don't see that happening in the Arctic. We see it more as a long, persistent emission coming out over a century. Now, I don't know if that makes it better or worse because we're still um, dealing with these emissions that will eventually have an impact, but in terms of something that happens tomorrow, it's unlikely to happen from the processes that we know about. I'm going to show one picture now. Now that I told you that last point, <laughs> let me show you this picture from Siberia. This picture is a giant hole in the ground. You might have seen it in newspapers. It's about 50 meters across, 50, and it's, it goes deep. It's like a big cavern, and, and there's not a lot of sort of peer-reviewed science literature on it, but, but Russian scientists put down you know, sensors and said there was elevated methane in there. And, and what fascinates me as someone that goes to the Arctic a lot and, and looks at what's happening is that I've never seen um, anything quite like this. And partly the reason is I told you about the ice in the ground and the ground sort of subsiding in. And so when you see that um, stuff on the top kind of is falling into a hole, here actually material got um, moved out of the hole. There's sort of an ejection. You can imagine you know, this whole kind of bursting. I, I sometimes wonder, is this a big sort of bubble, perhaps, of methane or gas trapped by permafrost? As the permafrost is thinning, it, it releases. And I'm not saying that this has sort of global significance, but the reason why it's so important is if, if me or, or any of my colleagues are not familiar with seeing anything like this, it means that there are things in the Arctic that we don't know about yet. <laughs> there may be surprises, and I... I still think something like this um, you know, makes me realize that as much as we quantify, we don't know everything. Okay, so let me um, shift sort of, okay, there's all these extra carbon emissions. They add up. They add up in sizes that matter. You know, this is more thinking about, okay, what do we do as, as people about this or policymakers? Um, a couple key points is everywhere I've showed you that when we use lower or yeah, slower warming scenarios like the RCP 4.5, if we limit human emissions and the Earth is warming more slowly, that helps limit permafrost carbon emissions. So that's a good thing. So anything that we do to reduce human sources is kind of slowing that trigger down. So I think um, thinking about mitigation is really important. You know, as we do that planning, we also want to be accounting for extra emissions out of the Arctic. That's a key thing, too. And so I put here as our second point is we really do want to be able to forecast permafrost carbon emissions. And then we also want to be able to monitor it. 
and my analogy here is it's a little bit like the weather and so you know we've done really well um, with weather forecasting and it's very important to society we're not thinking about changing the weather it doesn't matter if we we can't make it not rain today in Washington DC but having a forecast of where and when it is going to rain is really really important so I think Arctic carbon emissions are like that also where we need to have our observation systems to know sort of if these projected rates are true and then also you know are there are any surprises out there we'd want to know that they're happening and then so that's sort of from the global climate side and then also we'd want to be sort of evaluating risk costs and mitigation so we do want to be doing sort of these reports and syntheses trying to look at what are the projected costs of doing doing something about it okay so um, I'm getting to the point I probably have a couple more slides so I'll just um, sort of show them and I think I'm trying to pivot a little bit from the science knowledge that's the core of the permafrost action team, the permafrost carbon network, and talk to you a little bit about some of our other activities. I mentioned we have a couple reports, one um, that was put out by UNEP that's the policy implications of warming permafrost, and then our five-year um, report here. And, I, and really the next couple slides are just sort of highlighting what else we're doing as part of the permafrost carbon network to sort of put that science information out there. So we spend a lot of time um, taking the synthesis science to other scientists. So one of our audiences is, is um, kind of communicating these results to other carbon cycle scientists that work outside the Arctic. So we attend AGU, EGU, um, also these sort of science policy meetings where um, sort of people from different disciplines get together. And so we spent a lot of time sort of getting the message out through that and then also in, in publications in scientific literature. But again, as I mentioned at the outset, we're trying to carry that information farther. And so we, we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we take that science and communicate it more broadly. And I'm, I'm happy for sort of input back on these kind of activities. But things that we've been doing, of course, when we do these synthesis papers that are in high profile journals, we do get a lot of interest from the media and that's one outlet that we're we're able to make uh, you know use to sort of get the message uh, broadcast more widely um, this last year in Alaska if you've been reading the newspaper you probably know it was a near record fire season so that was another heightened sort of public interest anytime we're setting new records that seems to catch people's attention we seem to set new records every other year so that's kind of a useful tool to to uh, communicate the changing Arctic and then finally we spend time actually writing um, non-science articles, and I say we as members of the, of the Permafrost Carbon Network, trying to get this information into publications that are, are read out, outside the science community. And then finally we take this information and, and, and put it um, largely into sort of one of the reports I showed you, but also these sort of higher level syntheses like the IPCC report, the um, second state of the carbon cycle report that's um, now underway, and then other places where science gets synthesized and sort of made, made available for, um, I'll say, general consumption. <laughs> and then, of course, giving talks like this and other briefing reports helps sort of bring this information more widely, including you know, feeding information into something like the president's visit to Alaska, which I think did bring a lot of attention into the changing Arctic. So these are all things that we're doing, but I'd be interested in sort of feedback on on what other things might be of interest to the broader community. Um, I want to end in one minute and I'll just show you where we're going next because I think that that's important. So the Permafrost Carbon Network is continuing to put out new synthesis articles and then um, we've been we've been really generating the science synthesis out of these workshops. We have one upcoming in Germany where we do a lot of international outreach at a permafrost meeting. And then we have a number of um, what we think are key next generation science synthesis products. There's a lot of interest on this, but sometimes the science isn't as strong as you might hope. So I mentioned already the, the permafrost carbon model intercomparison. We're doing those future projections. We've made um, tremendous progress on this question of abrupt thaw. We really need to get that moving forward. And I'm not showing you kind of the maps we've created out of it, but, but that's an important um, topic that, that I see sort of emerging in the next couple of years. And then methane, which I already talked about how important it is, 
Um, I've largely talked about methane from organic carbon. There's also hydrates under the permafrost and in the ocean. There's a lot, there's sparse data and I think an incomplete understanding. I think really science has a lot to play in terms of a new synthesis on this. And then finally, we've been talking about thawing permafrost and warmer temperatures, but there's a whole interaction through the hydrology of the Arctic. And I showed you a little bit about the surface subsiding and water ponding, but that has important implications for both abrupt thaw and then also this methane and carbon dioxide question. So that's where we're going as the permafrost carbon network. Um, the action team, which is one level higher than just carbon, um, has a steering committee and a new postdoc that's going to push some of the synthesis forward, but we're looking towards sort of partnering on these other themes. So um, really, when we try to assess risk to, to infrastructure or to ecosystem services, what are key data sets that we can synthesize to help push those efforts forward? And so we're thinking about within this context um, of, of holding a workshop trying to brainstorm, you know, top three important um, synthesis science activities that we could undertake. So if anyone has any interest in sort of these particular topics and would be interested in participating or partnering on a workshop, um, feel free to talk to me afterwards. This is my final slide and, and I think, yeah, I don't know if you can see this from the back of the room, but this is a good Alaska fieldwork pi picture because all these like bits of dirt and dust on the slide are actually mosquitoes flying around as we um, um, do our field work in Alaska, and, the, and because of all these mosquitoes, that's why we're, we basically wear, you know, a moon suit to go out there. Um, this, this person is completely protected to uh, be able to sample soils without getting eaten, eaten alive. But this is just reflecting a little bit on why we built this science network, this synthesis network, is really, we can think about taking observations, but I think the synthesis side of it, the human network, which are the scientists, Bringing them together in this sort of active synthesis network has really added a huge component to actually making measurements, and sometimes we forget about that. And the way that that network worked is that it was really having a clear, coherent science question. What is the impact of changing permafrost carbon on climate that really brought people together? And then by having these workshops and being able to feed into the synthesis, it really brought together both the science information and then people that wanted to use it. And now that we have this network, I think it's actually a great tool as people have new questions emerging. You know, we've laid some of the groundwork and then we're sort of ready to answer the next question when and where it emerges. So I will end on that note. Um, I went a few minutes longer than I hoped, but I'm happy to answer questions um, from the audience or from the webinar more broadly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ted. So um, who has questions? Uh, Rafe, uh, please press the button on your microphone. And if you're online, please uh, put your questions into the uh, box on the right-hand side. Thanks. Uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. I, I would ask you, you know, just to expand a bit on the surprise uh, piece, the 50-meter hole. Uh, just uh, correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is there a possibility, and perhaps this is part of the future of research, that I mean, one form of methane release is out of the carbon in the soil. The question is, what's beneath the permafrost? Is the permafrost a cap for large uh, quantities of methane, e either in the form of gas, just gas, or hydrates, or what have you? Yeah, so that is a, a good question, and in, in sort of the science that I talked about didn't get too much into hydrates. So hydrates being sort of the frozen form of methane ice that exists at low temperature and high pressure. So those are sort of deep in the ground under permafrost, and they're also in the sea bed. And I think the picture I showed you, um, you know, it's not clear. That, that, of course, is probably not organic carbon, but it could be sort of fossil methane, like you said, capped by permafrost. I think... That picture sort of shows me that, um, you know, we don't even know that, we didn't even know that thing was there. <laughs> we can't see below ground like that. And so we have a very hard time sort of estimating how big and how much it is. So I think that um, along with the organic carbon that decomposes, 
we are also thinking about these this hydrate question that you brought up. And the methane synthesis that I was talking about at the very end is trying to incorporate sort of both of those sources. I think we're um, we're we're still a little ways off from being able to put a number to that. But I think it's I mean seeing it makes it seem like there's an important thing that we need to count. Can I just follow up and yeah, say one ahead. of the things in the policy world, uh, well, this would be an interesting question, which is should there be a an asterisk huh, under the 2100 emissions for what is ultimately found beneath th this sort of additional potential source uh, of, of non-organic methane? I mean, it's sort of interesting if you're trying to provide information to policymakers, they need to know as early as possible what the risk is. Even if it's not well quantified, how big is that risk? And at this point, it's kind of silence. And I'm just wondering, is there an alternative to that science that lays out what's being thought about? I, I, I don't want to take up too much time. but Yeah, and, and that's a good um, point is if you look at some of our other synthesis um, work, we do try to say, here's what's measured and known, and we also try to put a fingerprint on the unknown. And you know, as a scientist, you want a number, but we, 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 are, we don't leave it blank. I guess that's the point. And so I would think that we'd be, be taking that same approach for the methane budget. We don't pretend it's not there, but we also kind of put the limits of quantification. All right, let's see. Uh, John Farrell? Hi, Ted. Thank you for the talk. I have a question which is sort of a knowledge to action question. You talked about providing information to the White House for the President's visit to Alaska, and the President focused a lot on a lot of coastal communities that are eroding and falling into the ocean. A lot of that's because the permafrost beneath them is falling. So what I'm curious about is for these communities, some of them have mayors, some of them have city managers, how is the work that the network is doing providing information to the responsible government agencies like the Army Corps and others so that they can assess the current state of the permafrost beneath these coastal communities and the potential places where they may relocate these communities. How is it being done on a very practical local level? Um, yeah, so you asked a couple of things sort of, you know, how, how is that knowledge getting to those people, but then you also asked about our particular network. And so uh, I'll say right now, at least for the permafrost carbon network, we've taken sort of this global approach. And I think you can ask, you can there's always going to be an issue of scale, and so let's talk about communities knowing the ground ice underneath that. That's going to be sort of a scale of, of that community or that village, and so rather than sort of trying to understand the Arctic-wide ice content. And so I think our particular role is sort of providing the global view to that, but I mean there are agencies and um, and people that can provide sort of local information. So I think when we're talking about infrastructure, yeah, we're going to be talking about making measurements, you know, at that site because we want to know if that airport or that house is under risk. So there's kind of two levels of science knowledge that are going on. We're, I, I do think in a higher level synthesis, you can take information from places and build it up, but then you can't always sort of go from a global picture and say, okay, that community is going to um, you know, have this risk based on its on its zone of permafrost. Right now, that's probably how it's happening. So we're using these large scale maps and saying, okay, there's a community that's at some risk, but but, but that's probably pretty far off from sort of the actual risk at that location. So that was not a great answer to scaling. Scaling is a great <laughs> scientific question as as well as a political question. But I mean, people. I think the thing about mitigating specific communities is that there is interest at that level of, of getting that information, and so you know that is going on. But basic research isn't being used for those specific types of things. Or well, I wouldn't updating. call that. I wouldn't call it basic research at that point. But there are you know permafrost engineers that will go and core that site where they're going to build a building or where a village is and gather that information. Thank you.
So I uh, have a couple of questions online. Uh, one of them related to John's question. Uh, this is from Lisa Guy. It says, uh, does permafrost thaw more rapidly near the coast where the temperatures might be more moderate? If so, are coastal communities more vulnerable to infrastructure damage from thawing ground than interior communities? Um, that's a good question and also complex. So, so there's an interaction between receding sea ice and erosion and the temperature of frozen ground. So, um, so permafrost does warm the further south you are, and it's colder the further north. And then the recession of sea ice has exposed coasts to winter storms, and that's that's one of the primary kind of causes of erosion. I think even more so sort of than the temperature of the permafrost. So there's a complex interplay between um, those features, and so I think it's a it's it's a little too. Um, simple to say that the marine communities are, are more at risk than interior because it's going to depend on the latitude, the ground ice, and the um, climate that's changing. All right, so uh, another question from John Ingalls. Uh, do methane hydrates have a narrow temperature band where they destabilize or thaw, or is it slower over a wider temperature range, or do we even know? Um, there is a temperature range that allows them to persist, so at low temperatures and, and high pressures. I think the the one thing about hydrates that's helpful is that that is deep in the ground, underneath the permafrost or underneath the ocean. And so if you think about changes that are happening in the atmosphere, those, are, those conceivably take longer to propagate that deep. So that's one sort of advantage for the stability of hydrates. But... Um, the flip side of that, as I talked about, something like the abrupt permafrost thaw, there are processes that kind of cause permafrost to thaw faster than this sort of just top-down warming. So I think people do consider that when they think about hydrate stability as well. Thanks. Um, in the room, I think, uh, go ahead. Uh, press the button on your mic so we can uh, hear you online. Okay. Thanks. I'm Laura Geller with the Polar Research Board. Um, I guess I'm sort of going back to the, the line of questioning that the Rafe had about um, sort of what, what the policymakers ultimately need. So when I think about you know the, the type of policymakers who are involved in the, in the international UNFCC negotiations, you know, obviously, I think at this point they're well aware of this issue as, as part of the picture. I think you all have done a very good job in your communications to, to help ensure that happens. But it's not really factored in in a quantitative way to their to their planning. And I'm just trying to think, you know, what ultimately in a perfect world, if we had all the information we needed, what sort of you know metrics would we be aiming for? Um, you know, I, I ultimately would we be trying to get it, you know, on a country by country basis, trying to quantify the potential sources from from permafrost carbon, so that can be counted in the you know. The, country level accounting for sources and sinks. I mean, it's sort of like we do, I guess, for, for say, forestry sources and sinks. We're at a point where we can start to factor that into the equation for individual countries. Is that all a reasonable goal for the permafrost carbon, or is it just too heterogeneous and too many unknowns? Could we ever get it a real robust metric like that? I mean, I think, I think that's an important point. So from the science side, we haven't approached it at the country level, but I think it's very feasible, and and maybe I should, I mean, this is sort of a um, kind of respond back to sort of the local infrastructure, that, that most of the work we've been doing is thinking about um, decision makers, thinking about climate policy, and they're measuring this in, you know, tons of carbon, you know, per year, and so we sort of scale that at the global scale to talk about its importance, but the maps are regional and country level. So you could imagine going towards that um, kind of framework that's used for yeah, land use, land cover change. I think it's very plausible um, and in sort of it's very extractable from the current syntheses that we have. So uh, I have a couple more online here. Um, so this is about uh, fires, and the question is uh, from uh, Ed Struzik. Uh, is it possible to quantify how future fires, both uh, forest and tundra fires, will have um, the effect on permafrost thaw? Yeah, so fires, that's a good question, and I, I sort of mentioned a little bit the fire season but didn't talk about fire as a process. and. And so the answer is yes. So people are forecasting and projecting fire spread. And the reason why it's important to permafrost is that 
the surface um, soil actually insulates the permafrost, and so a fire can burn that, and then it sort of accelerates the rate of permafrost change. And so um, there are so fire is sort of an important mechanism that makes everything go faster. And and the current projections are for fire. Um, both frequency and area to sort of expand for a while as vegetation changes. So fire is a, an important point of the part of this that I didn't sort of talk about explicitly, but we do factor it into thinking about how fast things might change. So uh, here's a question from Norman Bliss. Uh, is the uh, tipping point concept useful for thinking about Arctic permafrost carbon release? And if so, have we reached the tipping point? Um, I was having a conversation about tipping point last night, and I think um, it's a tricky word because it 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 has a time scale. It's time scale independent, but um, time scale matters. So if you zoom back and you think about atmospheric carbon stability, we were very stable until the industrial period, and then we've shot up, and we're sort of going through a global tipping point on these several hundred year time frame. But of course people want to know about a tipping point that's happening this year, the next year, or five years from now, and I, I think sometimes people use a tipping point on that time frame. And as I sort of indicated earlier, I think permafrost is going to be this, this um, slow, persistent additional source rather than something that happens you know, just next year and we're going to all notice. In that way, I think it's more challenging because as the Earth goes through this shift, um, you know, are people noticing? <laughs> and does it affect us or our kids and our grandkids? From an Earth perspective, of course, that all is a big tipping point. You know, from a human lifespan, we tend to see a little bit more short. So I think the concept is useful, but we really have to talk about the time frame to make it um, have real utility. Yeah, that's very important. Uh, let's see, um, in the back there, um, pre please press the button, thanks. Hi, uh, Marcus Teraphim from the EPA. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, my question is about um, commitment uh, of sort of continuing uh, carbon releases and if in you know, the optimistic scenario that we stabilize temperature, does uh, carbon release from permafrost sort of peak and start declining at that point or does it continue increasing for a while before it eventually uh, declines and then sort of what rate does the does the carbon release decline after after temperature stabilization? Yeah, and that those are good questions on the forefront of research. You know, for sure the carbon system is moving more slowly than climate. So we know even if warming stopped today, we, we know both that global climate still gets a bit warmer and and emissions are going to keep going. And so, you know, I, I mentioned a little bit sort of, okay, here's the estimate by 2100, but you can imagine, you know, carbon emissions going for several centuries beyond that. I mean, they should, if you come to a new steady state on global temperature, yes, you'll, you'll taper your emissions, but it will take decades to centuries. And maybe that goes back to Norm Liss's question about, you know, is this irreversible or, you know, how can you stop it? And for sure there's a lot of momentum in this system. So the changes that we see now are going to persist for decades and longer even if we stop everything. Anyone else? Yeah, so in the back, could you uh, move to one of the microphones so we can uh, hear you online? Uh, thanks for the presentation. Two questions. The first is what are the time scales that are used in global, global warming potentials for CO2 and methane? Uh, in these studies, and does that change the decadal to century time frame that you're looking at? And then the second question is a little more facetious, but at one point you made a side note that we don't do weather forecasting to change the weather. Uh, last year, the National Academies released a study on climate engineering. Uh, do you think that climate engineering and, per and carbon release from permafrost thaw are things that could operate in tandem? Thank you. Yeah, those are both questions that are good questions. I'll take the first one because it's easier. Um, as, as you probably know, the global warming potential of, of a kilogram of methane has like an, has a nonlinear effect on climate over time. So that global warming potential is not a single number, but it's a, it's a pulse trajectory over a certain time frame. So we account for that um, in sort of our calculations. So the, the longer you look out, the less of effect methane has as it's converted to CO2. And so we, we use those trajectories when we sort of base our estimates on that. 
And then the second question, it, and you're right, maybe the weather forecasting and climate change are not um, exact parallels because you know, we do think that if we reduce human emissions, we influence the pace of cl climate change. And that's a different analogy than weather where we really want to forecast it, but we're not necessarily trying to alter its trajectory. So I think in a system, maybe what I meant about the Arctic is I don't think going to the Arctic and directly trying to stop emissions there um, has much meaning because it's sort of non point source pollution, as it were, but but understanding the emissions and kind of both observing them and forecasting will help us understand how much is coming out, and that will inform our, our mitigation actions elsewhere. So I think I have uh, maybe time for one or two more. Um, the question online here is from Giselle Bramwell. It says, uh, what impact will increased rainfall and snowfall in the Arctic have on permafrost thaw? Yeah, those are good questions. As people are familiar with, you know, the models do temperature probably better than moisture, and and then in the Arctic you have a sort of added feature, which is the water balance of the Arctic is not only the, the input, so rain and snow, but more importantly, it has to do with drainage. So there's forests in interior Alaska, even though it gets 300 millimeters of rain per year, which we would consider sort of a desert ecosystem, and primarily that's because water cannot penetrate the permafrost, so water sits at the surface and fuels the growth of forests. So almost more importantly than how much rain or snow, and in, in the, the climate models do project in a warmer world you'll have more precipitation because warmer air holds more moisture, so you'll have more precipitation in the north, but as the permafrost um, degrades and is in deeper in the ground, that surface water is no longer accessible to plants and, and animals living at the surface. And so that's probably the bigger effect driving sort of the influence on the ecosystems. It's really hard to understand and project how that will look in the future, but um, we're trying to get there. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, would everybody uh, please join me in thanking Ted again? Thank you. I wanted to uh, point out a couple of additional resources. One of our partners in today's event, the Arctic Institute, has a, a very nice website that talks about various permafrost issues. I encourage you to check that out. Um, also, uh, for more information about Arcus, you can check out our website as well at arcus.org. Um, and thank you all for coming out. I should mention our next seminar is going to be featuring uh, um, Mark Brzezinski, who 